What's up guys and welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you just want to finish off the Aeneid. Well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video and as you can see from the title we're going to be discussing book 12 of Virgil's Aeneid. If I could summarize book 12 into a one sentence, it would just be that Turnus dies. That, my friends, is the most important thing that happens in the last book of the Aeneid. Obviously, that means that then Aeneas wins his whole duel. He then ends up ruling over uh, Lavinium, which he then does because he ends up marrying Lavinia, who is the person who gives her name to Lavinium. And so therefore, the whole future of Rome is put into place and it is a beautiful ending, a very tragic ending, but a very beautiful ending to the book. So with that being said, why don't we just roll into the narrative in order to make that make a little bit more sense. So I left you at the end of book 11, it was nightfall. Both Turnus and Aeneas have then gone to their respective camps in order to discuss and figure out what they are going to do the following day. We see Turnus first, right? So Turnus is the guy who's really putting the story into motion and he goes to the Latins and he basically says that now it's time to shine, that tomorrow he is going to fight Aeneas and that is essentially the most important thing of what he says to all of the Latins in this moment. However, Latinus and his queen Amata are listening to this and now Latinus takes it upon himself to backpedal and to tell Turnus that he doesn't want him to die, which I feel like is a really bad time. Now that Turnus has accepted his fate, Latinus is suddenly like, hey dude, there are actually loads of other pretty people that you could marry if you so want to. I'll give you any of them in marriage, but like it was a whole like fate thing that I should have given her to Aeneas, this whole jest, but like my wife really likes you and I kind of really liked you and so that's why we sort of put up with this whole war, but like please, we don't want you to die, like we don't hate you. Turnus then replies, it's a little too late for that old man, I'm already good with it. Queen Amata then gets involved and she starts begging Turnus to really value his life and to save it, but again, I think that she really fancies him and that she's actually just living through Lavinia, so she is really begging him like, please don't die, Turnus. Lavinia even starts crying along with her mother. She's, you know, like her cheeks go all red. She starts crying. Everybody is super sad that Turnus has unfortunately already accepted that he's going to duel with Aeneas and that he's gonna fight him. So that's already decided. Turnus though, ignores all of them. He sends a messenger to Aeneas to tell him that at dawn they're going to meet and they're going to battle it out and whoever wins, whoever is the one that survives, because they're going to battle it out to the death, whoever survives will win Lavinia's hand in marriage. And so that guy is then sent off, Turnus has decided, everybody's super upset in the Latin camp. We then have this super heroic moment of Turnus where once he finishes speaking, once the messenger has been sent off, he actually runs back to go and start getting his chariot ready, get his horses ready, he picks up his spear and he lets out this great cry. Grant me the the power to bring down Aeneas. We're told that like sparks are flying from his face, that his eyes are flashing with like fire and all of this, like he is ready to go. Aeneas meanwhile, he gets the messenger, he receives the messenger, he hears the message, he accepts Turnus' offer in order to fight the next day and so he sends back his own envoys to go and tell Turnus that he accepts. So cut to the next day and now everybody gets up really early and they start getting the, uh, the, the sort of spot on the battlefield where they're going to fight. They start measuring that all out. Some people are doing that. Some people are bringing altars and sacrifices to this plot of land but then all of a sudden the signal is given and so everybody via the signal is told to then move out and to leave space for the two heroes to come into the middle of it and to accept the terms and conditions of the treaty. Before we hear what the terms and conditions are of this treaty, even though we pretty much know what it is, but before we hear any of this officially being done on the battlefield that our narrative cuts to Juno. Now Juno has been watching this all from the Alban mountain which actually we are told of the time of like the story is being told in regards to like real time of Aeneas and Turnus it was not called the Alban mountain then however to a modern audience to Virgil's to Virgil's even, <laughs> a modern audience that that is then called uh, the Alban Mountain then. So that is something that they could have related to. That is where Juno is sitting. And she at this time calls upon this character called Juturna, who is a new character for the last part of the book. But Juturna is important because she is the sister of Turnus. She's goddess sister of Turnus. And Juno speaks to her and I think like one of the funniest things that she's ever said across all Greek and Roman mythology, I am just going to read out the quote because I don't think that I could say it funnier. So she opens by saying, Nymph, you know how I have favored you above all women of Italy who have slept with my husband. I just, I can't even get through that line without laughing because it's just like, why would you open that with such awkwardness? Like, great, now you both acknowledge that you've slept with, well, Juno's acknowledging that she has obviously slept with her husband, but then Juturna is the only other woman that she favors above all the other women 
in Italy who have also slept with her husband. It's just such an awkward opening, I think, that it's genuinely hilarious. But that's obviously not all that Juno says. She doesn't just stop there. In fact, she continues. Juno says that now is the time that Turnus will be confronting his destiny. And so therefore, she wants to send Juturna down to delay it just a, a little, a little bit longer. She wants to help Turnus a little bit more. Uh, she's decided that that's what she's going to do because she feels really, really bad. Because as she had seen the two heroes sort of come into the middle and like sort of line up against each other, she realizes how unfair the fight is going to be. So she thinks that maybe Turnus, obviously he's going to die. She knows that. She acknowledges the fate, but she thinks that she wants, she she really just wants him to seem a little bit more heroic because they are so outmatched for one another that Aeneas is so obviously going to win this fight that she wants him to have a little bit more like an oomph to him and an oomph to his side of the fight. Back on the battlefield though, everybody arrives into the middle. So we have Latinus and Turnus on one side and we have Aeneas and Ascanius come on the other. Aeneas then is the one to pray up to the gods initially and he is the one to announce sort of the terms and conditions of this fight that he says that if he wins, then he will obviously take Lavinia. He will then uh, rule over a land that is then called after her name, so Lavinium. And then, uh, yeah, everything will be happy and great and there will be peace forever. However, if Turnus does win, then Ulysses and all of the uh, remainders, because obviously he's going to die, but all the remainders of the Trojans and all of their allies will go to just live with Evander and then will live in peace that way. So they will be part of that kingdom and the Latins will continue to live how they have before. Latinus then responds and just basically says that he hears, as you know, the king of the Latins, he hears exactly what Aeneas has said and he acknowledges it and he uh, he accepts it. He accepts those terms and conditions. He promises that his Latins will not disobey the treaty that they have just said. And everybody is pretty happy with that. I say that everybody seems to be really happy with that because immediately we have a breaking of this truth. It literally just just happened, you guys. And then all of a sudden, the Rutulians are watching them as they get closer and closer together. Remember that Juno has already acknowledged that there's probably not an even fight, but the Rutulians, because they're mortals, they are just clocking this and they're like, that doesn't look fair. In fact, this difference is so obvious to them that they start like whispering, starts, you know, like all this rumor, but not like rumor personified, just like their own room is now going through the camps and going through all the people and they're all being like Turnus cannot win this there is absolutely no way that he can win up against like the monster that Aeneas is now this is where Juturna gets involved this is where Juturna starts to stir the pot okay so she comes into it she takes in the disguise of this guy called yeah, oh, Camus, I think is his name. Um, I did write it down, but I don't know how to say it. So it's C-A-M-E-R-S, Camus, Camus, whatever the f his name is. He's not important, okay? That's why she takes on his form. So she comes down in his form and she says to the rest of the army, look at how few the Trojan armies are. Look at all of them. We outnumber them massively. If only half of us, if only half of our army fought, we would still trump them in numbers. So what are we doing just standing by and allowing Turnus to fight Aeneas one-on-one? -on -one? Now this alone starts firing up a lot, a lot of the army. They start hearing to turn in disguise. They think that he's, you know, well, they think that she as a he, because she's described as a he, that he is, you know, saying all of this like really, really, you know, <laughs> logical shit right now. And all of them start to get roused up. They start wanting to go and fight uh, for Turnus. And in fact, Juturna does even more than this to convince even the lot people that possibly they should be definitely possibly they should definitely be going in to defend Turnus. Juturna takes this like three steps further by deciding that she's going to send her own bird omen in order to show the rest of the Latins who are not 100% convinced that they should help Turnus that they uh, should actually go in and so she does this through a bird omen so she has one of Jupiter's eagles right it starts flying over the sky it spots this swan that's sort of like somewhere in front of them they can see spots a swan the eagle then swoops down and picks up the swan, right? And as it's, you know, flying off, it's well chuffed with itself that it managed to get this massive swan. It's like, look at me, it's got it in its talon. But as it's flying away, all these other birds decide that they're going to defend the swan. And so they then all go up, they start like attacking at the eagle, they start like pecking at it and all of this, the eagle's like, what? going on and then it drops the swan right and so then it flies off and all of the other birds are really proud of themselves they're just like look at us we fought off a massive eagle all of the latins are watching this and they now get an argo one of their own little personal argus to interpret this and the argo then does uh, solidify that the birds attacking the eagle we have the eagle being representative of aeneas we've got all of the little birds around it that are representative of the latins the laurentines and all of their you know allies and then we have the swan that is representative of Turnus. And so that is literally convincing the last of them to go in and defend Turnus, which means 
Yo, it means that the treaty is broken like immediately. In fact, right after this, all of the Latins just start attacking the Trojans. There's a massive, massive fight scene. We get lots of deaths in here. The first death is obviously the most important one. A spear is, fu is fired even. I was gonna say followed. <laughs> but a spear is fired at this guy and he falls. And that's when the Trojans then decide, okay, well, this sh we're then gonna fight too, even though they had literally just agreed on the treaty. When the fighting breaks out though, Aeneas sort of tries to step in amongst all of his men, sort of being like, what are you guys doing? Like, you, did you not hear us just agree on this treaty? We just have you do it. All of you need to stop fighting. And as he's saying this, he gets shot by an arrow, right? So like an arrow comes barreling into him and when he turns around to try and find out who it is, nobody owned up to it. So we don't know, like Virgil doesn't tell us, who actually hit Aeneas and he managed to get him. But he does get hit and so he can't stay in the fighting, he can't stay to be like, hey, cut it out! Because, you know, he's bleeding. So he comes off the battlefield, Turnus sees this happening and Turnus has the confidence to then go into battle and he kills a lot of people. No numbers though and no names are mentioned and so therefore all you have to know is that there were a lot of deaths via the hand of Turnus. While Turnus is killing everybody, Aeneas goes back to his camps and he gets healed by this guy by this name, Eapix? Eapix. I don't know where the stress is, but that is a guy who is healing him and we don't get anything else aside from just that he goes in and he heals him because he's using this water to clean the wound and Venus had seen all of this happen to Aeneas. She had gone to go and pick some plant and then took the power of this plant and put it into the water and so then Aeneas immediately starts feeling well. Okay, so that's the really basic summarized version of this very long story within a story that Virgil gives us. You just have to know that it comes from a plant that Venus picked because she wants to help her son but she can't actively get involved. Now that Aeneas is feeling fresh, he walks right up to his son and he goes right up to Aeolus and he tells him that he's now gonna go out and fight for him. But he says, when in due years you become a man, do not forget the bravery, do not forget the fighting honor of your father Aeneas and your uncle Hector. It's really sweet and he like kisses his head and then he walks back out onto the battlefield and you're like, what? When Aeneas starts making his way back out onto the battlefield and a lot of the Trojans start, you know, making way for him, Turnus even sees him approaching and Turnus is a bit like, I'm ready to fight. But guess who isn't ready for him to fight? His sister Juturna. So Juturna, <laughs> this is actually well funny. Um, So Turnus is in his chariot and she decides to go over to the chariot and she takes out Turnus's charioteer, because if you guys watch my whole Iliad series, there's always two in a chariot. You have to have one that drives and you have to have one that fights, right? So that's how these two things are balanced. And we now have Turnus's charioteer, who then gets taken out and literally just like left on the battlefield. And Turnus like, fuck that guy. And she takes on his form and gets into the chariot. In fact, when Turnus gets out to fight on the battlefield, because he doesn't notice this change initially, initially is the key word, but he doesn't notice initially, he gets out to fight and then Juturna like won't let him get into the chariot because Juturna's just like, I am not dragging him all the way to Aeneas. That is not happening. And so she keeps spotting him on the battlefield and then we'll just like turn around and be like, not today, Satan. And as that whole like cat and mouse situation starts happening between brother and sister, we switch to Aeneas who has his own little killing spree. Little, it's a very long killing spree. But again, lots of irrelevant characters, not really an important death and not really an important fight scene because the important fight scene is obviously going to be the one between Turnus and Aeneas, which is happening very shortly. However though, as Aeneas is fighting, this is when Venus gets involved, but again, she can't actively get involved. And so instead she just puts into his mind that he should go to the city of the Latins and go to the walls of the city and try to bring down the city because she notices that the city is not guarded, which means that Aeneas notices, but you know, he's infused by the god in order to notice this, that the city is not guarded. And so he starts instructing all of his men, all of his Trojans, all of the allies, to go straight for the city. So they form a wedge, that's what it's described as, that that's the formation that they go to, and they go straight to the city and they start throwing torches at it, they start attacking it like with fire and all of this, and the people inside the Latin city are now panicking. Okay, this is an understatement, they are terrified. In fact, Amata, the queen, she sees all of the Trojans attacking the city and she assumes incorrectly that Turnus has died and that's how they've managed to get this advantage on them. So she assumes Turnus is gone and this is a trigger warning, I'm so sorry, this is really late in the video, but there's a trigger warning right now, so just skip over, like just do the tap thing. But she hangs herself, okay? So she gets so depressed that she ties her own noose and she hangs herself because she feels to blame for Turnus' death because she did not try hard enough in order to, uh, to you know, bring him back and to not have him fight Aeneas. Lavinia then hears about the death of her mother and she does the whole, you know, tearing at her hair thing and beating her breast thing, the whole mourning thing, right? So Lavinia does that when hearing about um, Amata dying because she thinks that Turnus is dead, even though Turnus is alive. He will die in a hot second, but Amata 
is the first one to die. Unfortunately, this scene is then followed by cutting straight to Turnus. I'm laughing because it's just really unfortunate. It's kind of uncomfortable. It's like, you know, she thinks that he's dead and all of this. And then all of a sudden we cut back and Turnus is very much alive. And Turnus is basically chasing up stragglers and killing all of them. And he now wants to go and to fight Aeneas, right? Because he sees that now is the moment that he wants to go and do that. He's infused with all of this. And so he tells his charioteer, still seemingly unaware that it's Jaterna, he tells his charioteer and he's just like, why are we not going to the walls of the city? Let's go forward that way. Let's go and see what's going on. Jaterna in disguise is like, mm, actually over there, there are loads of more Trojans that you should kill. I think, I think that you should probably go and do that. Let's go that way. And in fact, she starts to drive the chariot that way and Turnus literally just sort of like hits her on the arm. He doesn't actually, there's no description of him doing that, but in my head, that's what he does. He hits her on the arm and he goes, Jaterna, I know it's you. I've known for some time. Is it such, really, is it such a bad thing that I have accepted that I'm gonna go and die for my people? And it's in this moment that we have somebody else ride over. And he rides over straight to Turnus whilst they're both in chariot and rides over to him and he says, you are our only hope. Aeneas is threatening the city, he's threatening the people, and you are the only person who can stop this madness. Turnus actually stops at this. He has this moment where he stops and he's described as sort of being like dumbfounded because it's just like this really obvious moment of fate and destiny kicking in. He kind of like, I mean, he knew beforehand, but it's this moment of like, the time is now, like this is now what's going to happen. So he looks at Jaterna, he looks at his sister, and he says something that again, I can't repeat any better than what's already written in the book. And so what he says to her is, sister, the time has come at last. Let go where fortune calls me. I must now meet Aeneas in battle. This is madness. But before I must die, let me be mad. I love that last line. I think it's a really, really beautiful moment for Turnus. And so Turner has a really, you know, sad moment, but she does understand what's going on. And she like grieves properly. She's grieving Turnus as if he's dead, like right now she's grieving him. And he goes, goes to where he's supposed to be in order to face Aeneas. So Jaterna drops Turnus off in front of everybody, right? And so he pops off the chariot, he walks through everybody, stalks through everybody, and he says, I should be the one to atone for this treaty for all of you. So bring Aeneas here. Where Turnus is standing, the army's part, and Aeneas hears the name of Turnus being called, and so he turns around from where he is attacking the walls, and he comes to stride over. Everybody is described as being amazed when the two heroes meet, right? So then they start to fight. There's nothing really specifically uh, discussed when they start to fight, they're throwing their spears at each other, they're engaging in combat, and it's now that Jupiter raises his scales, his really famous scales, to weigh out the fates of Aeneas and Turnus. Right, so this is an image from the Iliad. This happened with uh, Achilles and with Hector, and it happened a lot throughout the Iliad, but now Jupiter brings up his scales and he starts weighing out the fate. Unfortunately, unlike in that book, we are told whose fate is the one on like the lower scale. But in this one, I don't know why they don't tell us that. I'm just like, if you want to mirror the Iliad, then like tell us who's going to lose. I mean, we know, obviously we know as we did in the Iliad, but like they just tell us he's weighing it up. And I'm like, okay, but Turnus is losing. We know this. As the pair are engaging in battle though, we're told that Turnus gets a little advantage. He gets like really, really confident in his abilities. And so he goes to attack Aeneas with his sword. When their swords meet though, when Turnus comes at him with this huge blow that actually the sword he's holding it breaks, so it leaves him completely, completely defenseless in battle. No spear, no sword, Turnus is and Turnus knows this, so he does what Hector did in the Iliad. He does exactly, I mean, what is expected. Like, what else is he gonna do but turn around and run? Like, he books it. We are told that actually previously in the battle, like right now we're told that previously in the battle when Turnus had lost his sword and he had gone to go pick it up, he didn't actually pick up his sword, but he picked up somebody else's um, sword, like somebody who had died. One of their swords was on the ground and he picked up that sword instead, which is why it was so weak and it broke in combat with Aeneas. So it's not actually his sword that he's fighting with. So that's why it breaks and that's why he's at a disadvantage right now. And that is why he's running. So Turnus is sprinting, right? But we are told that Aeneas is hot on his heels. He's a little slowed down because of the arrow wound that he has to his whole ribcage. Minus that, he is pretty much hot on Turnus's heels. We're told that they run five times in one direction and five times in another direction, okay? So this is way more running than Hector and Achilles did. They run a long ass time. And in fact, at one point, Aeneas gets so fed up that he just decides to fire his spear, hoping that it's going to uh, hit Turnus. But it ends up getting lodged in like this tree stump or this little bit of wood. And so it's like thrown with such force that it's really in there, okay? So Aeneas has to, you know, like, like they're both running like this. And then Aeneas has to sort of go, whoop, let me go and get my, let me go and get my spear. And then he goes to this piece of wood, but he is trying to heave it out of it. And Jesus Christ, is it taking a long time where they've come now in the landscape they've now come to the sacred olive tree and that is where Turnus sort of yells up a prayer and he screams out pity me in war as Turnus screams though Aeneas is still struggling with a stupid fucking spear and so Turnus sees her chance to actually pick up 
Turnus's sword and to bring it to him, which obviously Venus watches this and does not like that. She's like, we shouldn't be getting involved. Why is she getting involved? And so Venus then helps her son by getting the spear out of the tree. You have to keep it even. But as that happens between the two gods, now Jupiter is watching this and Jupiter kind of knows that Juno has something to do with Juturna. And so Jupiter very simply turns to her and just says, okay, now is the end. So I forbid you to get involved anymore. Stop this. Juno then says, okay, I have abandoned Turnus which is what you told me to do with it. I had to abandon Turnus. I admit that I told you Turnus to get involved, but I will tell her not to. I will tell her that this is the end. No problem, it's okay. My only request is that when Aeneas wins, you do not have the Latins change their name, that you let them keep a very similar name because these are Italians. This is who they are. They are not Trojans. Troy has fallen. Make sure that the name has died with it, okay? That Aeneas and his men, they will take on the form and the identity of the Italians and they will not impose the Trojan name onto these people that already have a name. And Jupiter hears this and he does sympathize with her and he basically just says, okay. Understanding now what's going to happen, Jupiter sends down a fury to go and distract Turnus and to sort of let him know that now is the time that he's gonna die. The fury comes down in the form of a bird and flaps in front of Turnus' face to like really overwhelm him. So he's a little bit worried. And he's trying to, you know, bat this thing out of the way because he doesn't know it's a fury. And Jaterna, though, watching this, knows what this means. And she knows that now the gods are just saying, this is the moment, this is when fate comes into it. And so Jaterna sees this sign and she doesn't, like, she accepts it, but she's not happy with it. Seeing this sign, she literally just starts, like, beating her breast, tearing at her hair. She screams up to the gods and she's like, will anything without my dear brother be just as sweet? Will my life be as fulfilled? I don't know, but now I can't help you, Turnus. I'm so sorry, I've tried, but I can't help. And with that, Juturna abandons Turnus. Aeneas continues to pursue Turnus, right? And now they are without any gods. It's now just the hands of fate. So we know it's the moment that Turnus is going to die. And Aeneas keeps pursuing him and stops. And he shouts at Turnus saying, this is not a race. This is a contest. This is a contest for victory. And Turnus replies again with a line that I cannot say better than the book. And so the quote of what Turnus says in this moment is that he says to Aeneas, you are fierce, but wild words do not frighten me. It is the gods that cause me fear. And with that, Turnus actually turns around and he sees a rock and he sees that as his chance to uh, to throw it at, to, at Aeneas, you know, to slow him down and to, to hit him. But when he picks up the rock, which Virgil tells us is so big that 12 men couldn't pick it up, you know, we're supposed to see how strong Turnus is in his last little moments, but he picks up this rock and he goes to throw it, but you know, fate sort of stops him from doing that. So he doesn't get his full body weight behind it. And it ends up stopping in between the two men and sort of rolling towards um, Aeneas because Turnus is just sort of like frozen to the spot. When he's frozen and when he sort of comes through that, he turns around to look at his men. And that's the moment where Turnus knows that now is his time. Like he's really scared. He starts to fear death. He starts to fear this moment with Aeneas because he knows he can't win. As he falters though, Aeneas now fires his spear at Turnus and it hits Turnus, it goes through his shield, his like big shield, it goes through it and it hits him in the top of the thigh and it causes Turnus to buckle on that leg. And so he goes down onto his knee um, as he's going down and Aeneas is stalking towards him. Now, instead of Turnus doing sort of what you would expect Turnus to do in this moment, that uh, you know you would expect him to sort of go to Aeneas and to be like, I'm ready to die or whatever it is, that actually when Aeneas is approaching, Turnus starts to supplicate him because he really starts to fear death. And so he says that if Aeneas leaves him alive, you know, he'll do whatever it is that Aeneas wants. He acknowledges that Aeneas won, Lavinia is his. He's like, I don't even want her anymore, like all of this. He's properly supplicating Aeneas. And actually we're told that Aeneas hesitates, that the words of Turnus are so touching that Aeneas has a moment that he's like, I don't know if I can kill this man. Like, I don't know if I can do that. Like he's standing over him with his weapons. Turnus is looking and pleading up at him. And in fact, the only thing that switches Aeneas is that he notices that the armor that Turnus is wearing is palaces. Seeing the armor now on Turnus, he is just enraged. Like he just flips out. He flips shit. He's so, so mad that Turnus could could even try and beg for forgiveness when he's wearing the armor of someone that he's killed that was an ally to Aeneas. And in fact, Aeneas screams at him and Aeneas says, how could you ask that when wearing the armor of someone that I have loved? It is now Pallas who makes the sacrifice of you. It is Pallas who exacts the penalty of your guilty blood. And with that, Aeneas stabs Turnus in the chest. And the last few lines of the book are just Turnus 
dying. And and that's the end of the Aeneid. Oh my God, we're at the end of the Aeneid. What is happening? This is so incredibly wild. Thank you guys so much for uh, reading along with me and for joining in on this story. Um, I also want to obviously say that throughout this whole series, again, and I've said this in every single video, throughout this whole series, I have left out so much detail because there are so many minor characters and so many minor plot points that I could absolutely not do the story justice in uh, every way that it deserves because every single episode would be like an hour long. You'd be making a whole list of names and I wanna make this as uh, simple as possible. But um, oh my goodness, thank you guys so much for joining in with this whole series. Thank you guys so much for asking all the questions throughout the series, for getting involved, for reading the book. Um, yeah, it's, it's meant a lot to me. And even with all of these series, you know, this is now the last of the epic uh, cycle, the last of the epic poems that I'm doing. And so it's, it's completely insane. And I feel like I've accomplished a lot with these series. And I, I feel like I've grown with you guys. Um, so thank you guys for giving me a chance and for watching these videos and I hope that they help in some sort of way. Thank you guys so much, so much for tuning in to this series and for supporting the channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, but we'll be seeing you next time with more series and more videos here on Manic. So I'll see you then.